For this episode, I want to cover the topic of displacements. These are a special type of brush face that are used for terrain in Source. A displacement takes a single face of a brush and divides it up into a grid. Each vertex of the grid can then be moved to create a bumpy surface, and for certain materials they can blend between two different textures. Displacements are created through the use of the Texture Application tool, using Shift A, and then there's a second little menu that you may have already noticed here. You can make a displacement from any four-sided brush face. They don't have to be square, you can distort them as much as you need, but as long as they remain quads, they're good to go. Here, all of these on the left are quads, and these two on the right are triangular and pentagonal. And when I click create, you can see that these ones on the left, the quads, all got converted into a displacement, whereas nothing happened to the two on the right. Before you create one, it's important to be careful which faces you have selected. You will often only want one single face of a brush to be the displacement, Perhaps two if you're making the cliff corner or something, uh, but situations where you want every single face of a brush to be a displacement are quite rare. Uh, pressing create will turn every selected face into a displacement. If you realise you've accidentally made a displacement for a face you didn't intend, you can select it and press destroy. Displacements are one-sided though, so the other faces of this brush still have displacements on them. Now we're left with just the one. Once you've made a displacement face on a brush, all of the non-displacement faces will disappear. The original brush does still exist, as you can see it's here in the 2D view, and if I move it in the 2D view, you can see the displacement moves along with it. But the faces that disappeared will no longer contribute in any way to the compiled map. They won't be solid to players, they won't cast shadows, they won't get a light map, they effectively don't exist. When working with displacements, it's important to remember that they don't seal the map or block visibility calculations. So this area looks like it might be fully sealed from the void, as there are no gaps down the sides for anything to leak out of. However, because displacements can't seal a map, there's actually a massive hole underneath. This is what the compiler would see. To remedy this, we just need to back up the displacements with standard brushes behind them to seal the map, like this. If I put a big cliff here to separate the heavy and pyro, you might expect that from the heavy's perspective, the pyro shouldn't be rendering at all, because we can't see them, they're blocked by the cliff. However, from the engine's perspective, the pyro is very much visible. We can remedy this in the same way by putting a big brush in the middle. And now the engine will know that the two should not render each other. You just need to make sure that the brush you put between them is slightly smaller than the displacement, so it's not poking out, going to cause any extra shadows or anything like that. So how do we actually work with them? First, you'll need to make a brush using Shift-B to make the block tool, and swap over to the texture tool with Shift-A, Make sure you only have one face selected, and then move over to your displacement tab and click Create. You'll get a choice between Power 2, Power 3, and Power 4. That controls how many divisions you get at Power 2. You'll get 4x4 four four. at Power 3. You'll get 8x8, eight eight. and at Power 4, you'll get 16x16. 16 16. Generally, with displacements, I would try to start with a Power 2. If you need more divisions, use a Power 3, and if you need more than that, I would then start using smaller brushes, but multiples of them, because there's a physics compression issue with Power 4 displacements that can, under certain circumstances, cause crashes. So I would try to avoid those. Once you have your divided geometry, click Paint Geometry and you'll get a new window popping up. Your cursor will also change this little green wireframe sphere. The distance here is how many hammer units the vertex will move when you click on it. Because painting is not an operation where we're clicking individually, but where we're holding the mouse down and scrubbing over the terrain, and this updates every frame, this is 5 units per frame, which is far too much. So I'm going to set that to 0.5. You can also change the radius here, but it's much easier to hold ALT and left click and just simply drag and change the radius that way. So now as I scrub over the terrain, you can see it moving. I'm using my left mouse to move up, and if I swap to using the right mouse, it will move down again, and it can change the radius. You can also hold SHIFT and drag with the left mouse, and that will lock onto a single vertex. It will allow you to move the mouse up and down, and it will move irrespective of the distance that you have uh, have set. So you can you can nudge nudge things that way. The next option down here, we've just been using the raise lower, but the next one down will raise two. And so what that does is it will put all of the verts inside the sphere at whatever distance is away from the uh, base level of the displacement. So if I set it back to zero, we'll get our square back. And if I set it to uh, 100, it will put them all 100 units above where the square is. You can see that. And it's a very binary operation. It's all on or off. There's no uh, di smooth divisions between the two. It's, it's either putting it at that new height or it's leaving it alone. 
The third option, smooth, does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, however, for this, the distance, the slider is sort of inversed of what it was for the raising and lowering. So raising and lowering, you want very low numbers so that you can move it gradually. But for the smooth operation, a uh, very high number will do a gradual, gentle smoothing and a low number will do quite a harsh, sudden smooth. Uh, so let me do some raising and lowering so that we can see. I'll set that back down to 0.5 so that I can control what I'm raising and lowering. Here we go. So we got something that's quite rough. Now if I swap over the smooth and change this all the way so it's the smoothest possible, that's now applying a nice smoothing function to the displacement. All the verts within the sphere are getting brought towards each other. Underneath the smooth box there's this little spatial button here. So this is spatial mode which gives you the radius. If I turn it off spatial it enables this instead and it doesn't do anything for the smooth option so we'll need to go back to the raise lower one. What it gives you here is numbers instead so what these numbers represent is how many vertexes of adjacency it will do. So one is just the single vert, two is its vert and its neighbors, three is vert and its neighbors neighbors etc. This will give you a very precise and angular uh, movement. So if I hold down shift and drag upward like that, I get a very, very angular spike because it's not doing any kind of rounding or smoothing. It's just counting how many vertexes as neighbors. It's a similar effect for the raise two. With this, you get a selection of how many verts to apply, and then it's a very angular operation. And the non-spatial option for smoothing doesn't actually give you any options for radius. I'm not quite sure why, but it does give you quite a good smoothing operation. So far we've only really been looking at movement in one direction, but we can move the verts in any direction that we like. So if I swap back to raise and lower and just swap that back to a reasonable number, let's turn spatial on again. You can set specifically which axis you would like. So if I set this X axis and move, we're only moving in X. Uh, and I can set it to Y, or I can set it to Z, Z if I want specifically up and down movement. However, the face normal one is the default, and it is extremely powerful for making smooth things. So once you have a rough surface like this, you can hold down Alt and right click and see how the direction changed. Now that's the direction that will move. So this is really useful for making uh, smooth cliffs and such, or even jagged cliffs. When working with the face normal axis, people often like to use a picker brush like this. They might have a prefab or paste this from a different file they have, and then they can use this to accurately pick the each axis or 45 degrees or, you know, sort of all three, or they might have one that has even more divisions, um, but they'll paste that in and use it as a tool to help them make their displacements, and then they'll get rid of it when they're done with it. Raise 2 works exactly as you'd expect with the face normal, it moves in that direction. In the first cut, I didn't explain how smoothing works with the face normal very well, so let me take another attempt at it. The smoothing operation isn't actually a smoothing operation, it's a flattening operation. What this means is, when our displacement is moved primarily only in one direction, and we smooth along that direction, we get a result that we might expect if it were actually a smoothing function. Here I have a displacement that is mostly moved up and down, and if I smooth in an axis that is mostly up and down, we'll get something that seems like a smoothing function. However, it's only moving the verts along the yellow axis. Their relative positions to each other in any direction perpendicular to the yellow axis remain completely unchanged. If I undo that and change to a radically different face normal, it will now flatten to the plane perpendicular to that yellow axis. The verts at the sides have been crunched up because they didn't line up with this axis very well initially, whereas the verts in the middle did line up and so they haven't been brought together. So this isn't a smoothing function, it's a flattening function. If you want a more standard smoothing function, use the non-spatial version. This will smooth out the points, but also return them towards what they originally were before the displacement had any displacement in it at all. You see it's returned to the square. Painting alpha is for blending between two different textures. You can't just pick any two textures though. You have to pick a blend material that's already been specified as such. I'll swap back over to our material browser and I'll type in blend to find one of those. I'm going to pick this one here. Uh, and now I've got a uniformly muddy surface, but if I go into the paint alpha, this works very similar to the non-spatial one. It gives you, um, you know, one vertex worth of control, two, three, and uh, I'll lower that down a bit. Now I can paint in some grassy areas by simply scrubbing over the texture with the left mouse click, um, and then you can pull it back with the right mouse click. Uh, if I turn this way down, you can actually get sort of in-between value- oh, this 
is going way too fast. Let's go. Let's go with one. Yeah, you have to be very gentle to get the uh, the midway values, but you can get them. Certain ground textures like this one can be configured to have actual grass blades coming from them as sprites. To do that, we'll need to go over to the map menu and then map properties. Now this is the box where we changed our skybox texture before, but in this one we want to change the detail.vbsp file and the detail material file to match the material that we've got set up. So I know that this material is from sawmill, so I'll change our detail.vbsp to detail sawmill.vbsp and our material file from detail sprites to detail sprites sawmill. That will configure the blend texture to emit the grassy blades. Now you can kind of see them here. If I get a bit lower, you can see that they are now appearing from the surface. If you don't see them or you want to hide them for whatever reason, there is a toggle button here, this leaf, that will show or hide your detail sprites. The subdivide button applies something similar to Catmull Clark subdivision, which can be useful for very smooth surfaces. It's also a little bit tricky to work with. Here I've got a cube which has all six sides converted into a displacement, and if I click subdivide on this, I'll get a pretty good approximation of a sphere. Next to it I've got two faces that form a corner, and if I subdivide those, in the middle you can see that it kind of smooths out the corner. At the sides it's come to these sharp corners. But if you did want this corner profile, the way to achieve that is by extending the displacement to the left and to the right. Now when I have all of them selected and subdivide those, the middle one forms the nice profile and the outer two come to the spike. So I can delete the outer two and now I've got the nice profile that I wanted initially. The noise button does exactly what you might think. It gives you a minimum and a maximum value for noise, so I can put in, say, uh, minus 10 and plus 100, and then it will offset each vertex of this displacement by a random number in that range. Two displacements that are next to each other could be seamlessly stitched together using the sew button, as long as they share a common edge in the original brushes. You can see that these two share a common edge in the 2D views, but sometimes it's not very easy to see in the 2D view if your two brushes do actually share a common edge. In that circumstance, you can use the mask solid and display 3D toggles to see what the original brushes look like, and if I select them now, I can see that they do share a common edge. These two brushes, however, do not share a common edge. So if I turn the displacement back on and attempt to sew it, it will only affect that top vert where they do meet perfectly. All of the others are unaffected. While working in Hammer, it can sometimes be tricky to tell if a displacement is too steep for players to walk up. But you can use the DW button up here to mask the walkable areas. So any area that is too steep above the 45 degree limit will be rendered as yellow. Now I can see that this pyro here won't be able to run up the hill to their friend because it's too steep. We would need to smooth that out before we can do that. There are some extra options down here too. You can increase or decrease the power of a displacement after you've created it by affecting here. Elevation adds an offset height from the original face, which feels like quite a niche tool, particularly because that face will then no longer sew with any adjacent faces that have a differing elevation. If I put in 64 here and click apply, you'll see that this displacement has been raised 64 units. It will now no longer sew with its neighbors. I can put it back by changing that to zero, and now it's seamlessly joined with its neighbors. The scale is simply a multiplier, if I change this to 2, every vertex in this displacement will be moved twice as far from its original position as it was. You might think that because a displacement with elevation won't sew with its neighbours, this one also won't sew with its neighbours. However, it will. These three boxes here are for disabling collision. Physics collision is for physics objects, like ragdolls. Hull collision is for players and NPCs. And ray collision is for raycasts, like bullets. Select adjacent will select any neighbouring faces that share edges. If they would sew, select adjacent will select them. And then down here are toggles for the grid and for shading. I like to turn the grid off when I'm painting alpha because I think that allows me to see the texture better. To help you understand how displacements can be used in a finished map, I would recommend looking at some of the Valve maps that have been included with Brock's pack, which I recommended you download in episode one. Here's a view from one of my own maps, CP Snowplow, where you can see the displacements that I've used to create the cliffs and the uneven ground texture. If I toggle the displacements, you can see the brushes they're actually made up of. When I was learning to do displacements, I found that looking at examples like this from high quality maps really helped my understanding. I would also recommend this page on the Valve Developer Wiki. This is more or less a text version of everything that I've covered in this tutorial. I would also recommend watching Top Hat Waffle's excellent video on displacements. The video is 11 years old and aimed at Counter-Strike, however all of the information in it is transferable to Team Fortress 2. If you have any questions about the topics of this tutorial, pop them into the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. 
If you'd prefer real-time assistance with any TF2 mapping questions you might have, uh, check out the tf2maps.net Discord server, it's always active and full of very smart people that are ready to help. Stay tuned on this channel for more introductory tutorials just like this, and if you like what I'm doing and would like to support financially, consider buying a few map stamps for either Hoodoo, Man Manor, or Snowplow. The proceeds from map stamps are split directly between only the people that actually made each map. Valve don't take a cut, so they're a great way to support myself or other TF2 mappers directly. Thank you.